I just stayed in school waiting, thinking that he will appear. <laughs> I was called from Nairobi. I was, I was told to come to Changuli. They had something to tell me. It was about 1 p.m. And, and then I, went, I, I came out of the bed running. I jumped out of the bed. But there are some people who struggled inside. It was a painful incident. It was it was a horrifying sight. Mungu alikuwa na historia na moto. Ama mama yoe tu alanaamka. We are like taco. Twelve years ago, 67 students of Changuli High School in Machakos were killed after a fire swept through their dormitory at night. The students described as young, brilliant and with a promising future were killed by people suspected to be their fellow students. Did they have to die? Case Files starts now. At the far end of the compound that houses Changuli Secondary School in Machakos County is a memorial park. One that enjoys the peace of a school and a break, but one that speaks volumes. Volumes about young souls, a school tragedy, a dark past, and a community yet to recover 12 years on. Underneath the bed of flowers lie the remains of young students who died in an arson incident that not only shocked the country but one that jolted the entire education system. The park has for the last 12 years been home to the remains of 67 students of Changuli High School who died in the tragic incident. Each grave here containing the bodies of 10 students with one holding seven or lying side by side. From those who were in Form 1 that year to those in higher grades, all of whom perished on the fateful night. On the night of Sunday, 25th of March 2001, a fire swept through the upper dormitory, catching more than 100 students of God. 67 were not lucky. Yo, siku, my neighbor in the morning, Aliniambia, Bana Shule Kwanu Meskia Kumechomeka. Nikamwambia sijawahi kusikia makelele lakini kwa sababu nakuja kazi nitakuja kuangalia ni nini iko mbaya. Cecilia had worked at the school for close to 10 years as a front office attendant. She sat a few steps from where the school accountant sat. Inaitwa hii ni ile ya ile ya kifo. Sasa ukaona there something going on and a very bad one. Cecilia told Case Files that the moment she realized the dormitory had gone up in flames, the faces of young students she had called sons came to mind. Here it was Kifo. We were put here dorm, my bad yote, na much bado in na endelea. Kumbe ki endelea iwa tatu akondani. The story was bad because what you could see was just black remaining on the window That was around 7 a.m., seven hours after the screams were heard by neighbors around the school. The screams were not loud enough. The voices of the dying souls of Changuli drowning in the sound of the rain that very night. By the time the smoldering stopped, the roof of the dormitory had caved in. The walls of the male students hostel remained intact but the lives of dozens of students had gone up in smoke. 
Most of the students who died tried escaping through this wall and only do that served more than 100 students at a time. They all couldn't fit in the hallway. 67 never made it to the door that was so close yet so far. Don't talk to me. Look at me, okay? Yes. Lilian Odera was among the first journalists to arrive at the scene of the Sunday horror. We thought that the incident at the hospital was shocking enough. Nothing prepared me for what I saw when we got to the school. You could see an, a whole pile again of students who looked like they had been uh, trying to, to escape, uh, who were burnt there, piled up at the door. Of course, you could smell, uh, in the air, you could smell burning bodies. It was a painful incident. It was, it was a horrifying sight. Damaris' son, Kei Lukitata, was in Form 1. The entire family was an excited lot. Their firstborn child had been enrolled at Changuli Secondary School. But the news that came out of the school that morning shattered all their dreams. That particular day, I was at school, very busy teaching. Then a neighbor came to school and informed me that Changuli Secondary School has been the dormitories, one of the dormitories, the other one, has been burnt and rumor is, is that some boys have perished in the inferno. The school administration was at pain to explain to the parents what had become of their sons. I was called from Nairobi. I was, I was told to come to Changuli. They had something to tell me. Then uh, I asked uh, the, 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 the secretary what it was they wanted to tell me. But they were not telling me what it was exactly. So I pressurized her to tell me what was happening. But she could not even tell me. The painful reality that their sons were not among the lucky survivors became more pronounced when those who made it out alive were paraded in an open field. I reached at the school, I found so many parents and neighbors outside the school gate because it was locked. They were demanding for it to be opened, but the gatekeeper was undermined. He didn't want to open the gate. He said that the administration has told the, the, the watchman not to open for the parents. The rest of the boys were dead, piled up along the hallway in the dormitory. We went to the dormitory, but it, there was no, no more dormitory. It was lynched, it was ashes. Only one parent was able to notice his son. He had worn a shirt, and inside the shirt there was a fist receipt. It was removed, he read, and then he concluded that the body belongs to his son. But the other part of the body was nowhere. Among those who arrived at the school in the initial hours of the morning was the then president Daniel Moy. By the time the president left, the school had turned into a crime scene. Police investigators go down to work. With no suspects in mind, they began the huge task of recording statements from survivors of the fire tragedy. And we waited. We interacted with other students in the school, asking them whether, have you seen my son? Yes. Have you seen my son? Yes. Everybody was telling me that he saw him. I went to the, to the head teacher's office. I talked to the school secretary and asked her whether she, she saw my son. And she told me that my son is in the hospital. As police investigators tried to get into the bottom of the deadly inferno, parents and the school administration arrived at the decision to bury the 67 innocent boys in a mass grave just a few meters from where the upper dormitory stood.
two weeks later, two students were arrested in connection with the murder of the 67 male students. The girls dormitory offered police investigators crucial leads. One of the boys from the upper dormitory as it was commonly referred to was discovered lying on a mattress inside the girls hostel. His hands had been injured in the fire. It turned out the boy was not alone. Felix Mambongumba will later be picked up from his parents' house in Nairobi for questioning by the police. Felix was in Form 3 at the time and he will later shock police investigators with a confession that finally connected the dots of a devious plot that led to one of Kenya's worst school tragedies. Among Felix's best friends in the school was Davis Onyango Pio. The two were the only people to face charges of murder before a trial court in Nairobi over the Changuli fire incident. In a statement penned in his own handwriting, Felix gave the police a detailed account of the event that led to the setting ablaze of the school dormitory that houses fellow schoolmates. Sometimes in March 2001, a colleague to Felix Mambo Davis of Pio, also student at Changuli Secondary School, allegedly approached him with a plan to burn down the school dormitory. According to Pio, he was fed up with a new school principal. He accused the principal of high-handedness and complained that the food the school kitchen was providing was not good enough. Felix told police investigators that he contributed 600 shillings from the purchase of petrol. A date for the purchase of the petrol was arrived at, and as the rest of the students attended a sporting event in Machakos town, Felix and his friend Onyango headed to the town to purchase jerrycans where 15 liters of petrol was to be kept. That same day, Peter Mwanzi at the time a form to a student in the school went home with his colleagues. As young boys walking less than 25 kilometers from the school to home was routine. Na kubuka hiyo siku tulikuja huku na wa 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 my friends. Na walikuwa wengi. Tulikuwa kumi na kitu. Tulikuja huku tukakula maembe, tukaenda huko tukakula maembe na tukarudi shule. Sasa after supper tutorieda studies as normal. Tukasoma, tukasoma, tukafanya homeworks, tukaenda kulala saa nane, ah saa nne. Tulikuwa tunalala saa nne ndio tuamkia asubuhi studies. By this time Felix and Davis had returned to the school with their lethal liquid, 5 liters of petrol in one container with a second one containing 10 liters. The petrol was first kept inside the dormitory before Davies had it moved to an open field. That night the school head boy had some students complain to him that there was strong smell of petrol from the upper dormitory. On the very night the deputy head teacher, in the company of the head boy and the night guard, conducted a search near the dormitory but nothing came out of it. The head teacher would later show up in school too and was informed about the smell of the petrol before he went home. Only a few months earlier students at the school had tried to torch the library and the principal's house but the plot never worked. The signs of trouble were there but it appears no one took time to investigate them. Nobody took the issue seriously. That Sunday night the school retired for the night but hours later the upper dormitory erupted in flames. Chenye tulistukia ama mtu alikuwa anashtuliwa na moto ama mama yoe tu anaamka naenda ama anakimbia hiji. Peter told case files the fire spread quickly and he had to get out fast. Unajua mimi nilikuwa nimerara na sikusikia mama yoe na sikusikia njoto ama smoke ni kitu tu ile niniamusha yenye sio hizo mani nini hiyo kitu ikaniamusha ikaniamusha after kuniamusha mimi nikaona moto ndio hii yani inatoshana hivi yani haikuwa imeshika ma blanket ama mattress hmm? sasa nikaona juu hii murango imefungwa hii na murango ndio ile Nilifunga macho, nikafunga pumzi, 
na nikakibia yani ndani hiyo moto nikakimbia kutoka ije ndio ni yani ndio nilisikia nimechomeka tu nilikanyanga hivi nikashindwa kwa gari ya chini hii soro ya mguu haikuwa The raging flames did not spare some of the students who were sound asleep. Peter says he heard them scream, felt them try and fight their way out of the dormitory. He was the only one who survived. His cubemates, 17 of them, never made it out alive. They all died. The only door to the dormitory could only accommodate one student at the time. The second door was blocked by iron sheets making an escape in the event of fire virtually impossible. Many of those who survived had no idea who or how the fire started. Peter spent six months in hospital with 70% degree burns. Hospital. I did it when I am being sent back to Tomeka. Never pity I want. You did request Abu Yango to the hospital. On the second week of April 2001, Felix Mubao, Davis of Peel, appeared before a Nairobi court to face charges of murder. 67 murders in total. <laughs> The court was told how the two planned and executed their murderous plot that saw 67 of their colleagues perish in a night inferno. A night guard told the court that on the material day he spotted a person with a flashlight near the dormitory. Moments later, he spotted a student running. He stopped him and realized it was Felix Mumbao. Mumbao, according to the night guard, told him he had gone to drink some water. The deputy head teacher in the school will later tell the court that on the very night he had come across the same Felix, took his admission number and let him go to class. More than 100 witnesses testified during the trial that lasted close to two years. In a statement written and signed by Felix Gumbao, the Form 3 student admitted he had taken part in the purchase of the petrol but did not take part in burning the dormitory. Felix claims he was awoken by screams of fellow students that there was fire in the house. Davis, having confessed to taking part in the entire plot, will later claim in court that he was tortured and forced to pen his statement in the presence of police officers in Athenaeva. Felix, too, made the same claims. But the trial judge Robert Mutitu questioned why the two never complained to the trial magistrate, the trial judge or the officer in charge of the Thriva police station and only waited for such a long time to do so. From the court record, it is not clear why the prosecution failed, for instance, to question the taxi driver who helped the two ferry the jerrycans of petrol back to school or other students who might have taken part in the planning. <coughs> After almost two years of court proceedings, the prosecution was nearly winding up court proceedings when Justice Robert Mutitu resigned from office. The judge fell victim to the so-called radical surgery in which several judges were kicked out of the office over allegations of corruption in a purge led by Justice Aaron Ringera. From the court records, the murder trial was taken over by Justice Nicholas Zombija. But on December 4, 2003, he terminated the case terming it a mistrial. This on the grounds that the earlier judge, Justice Motitu, was said to be probed. In his ruling, Justice Umbija indicated that the two boys could still be arrested at a later date if more evidence emerged. But no court records exist of what really happened to the trial after Justice Umbija ruled it was a mistrial. At that time, I think a debate was going on on whether um, they could actually stand full trial as adults because they were minors at that time, they were under 18. Most of the parents were very bitter at the end of the day and you could tell um, 
the emotional pain uh, because they were saying if at all they had the mind to be able to execute such a crime then definitely they should be able to stand trial as full adults. Court officials told Kesfars the prosecution and the defense did not raise any objection when Ombija made the ruling. According to a court official, the court could not move to have the two tried afresh unless the prosecution made a new submission. It could have been up to the director of public prosecutions to direct the police to commence or terminate investigations into the matter. Felix Kumbau and Davis Onyango's trial came to an end. Justice Mutitu told case files that his exit from the judiciary had nothing to do with the trial. The whereabouts of the two boys linked to the Changuli fire tragedy remains unclear, but families that lost loved ones have not parted with the reality that the entire trial was mishandled. The family of Kilo Kitata, a Form 1 student who died in the deadly fire, says justice was never served. They took away the lives of the 67 and they were set free. And it is a bad lesson to, to others. Boys and girls will keep on leading the dormitories and killing their colleagues. Because if those ones were set free, why not them? The killers of their sons or the motive of such a large-scale destruction of human life have never been identified. But in a rare sign of defiance, Hilary Kitata still decided to enroll his two daughters in the same school years later, despite losing a son in that fire. The first day in school was a bit fun. Everybody was like, okay, I'm in, I'm in form one. So, but back in my mind, I knew that my brother was, was used to be there so I didn't know where the dormitory was so I, I asked some form two there to show me where the dormitory was they showed me but I was not happy after my parents left I cried I didn't feel happy anyway the dormitory where the 67 died is no more and in its place is grass and timber but the school has kept records of the young boys who died in the fire some of them described as brilliant young minds with a promising future. The bodies had been burnt beyond recognition and even the courts could only assign numbers to them during the trial. Here the school appended the admission numbers next to their photos to keep their memories alive. Peter Monzia says things have never been the same again. He lives in fear of enclosed areas. He cannot go near a fire and the mom says he has never recovered fully from the incident. Mungu anaguanga na mambao. Mungu anaguanga na mambao. Hiyo mambao yake ni ni toa hii. Twelve years on, the government has never explained what exactly happened to the trial or the whereabouts of the two boys arrested in connection to the fire tragedy. I could imagine that I, I, I was visiting my son almost when they are coming to the end of the term. And you know, during the first born, I had a lot of hope and uh, the boy was bright. And he had, uh, he had uh, lots of dreams uh, which he wanted to achieve as, uh, I mean, after growing up. And I, I, I asked myself, really, as any other parent, it could have been me. Changuli Secondary School still retains its original name. But behind these gates is a chilling story that seems to acquire new freshness each passing day. A story of young boys killed in the hands of their fellow students. The gate of the memorial park remains shut, only opened when parents of the departed boys come visiting to pay homage to the souls of 67 boys who never lived to realize their full potential. There is no release order filed at the criminal registry indicating that the two boys were freed or are still being held in custody. The families of the victims keep on asking, where is Felix Mambungumbao and his co-accused David Onyango Pio? I'm Dennis Onsarigo. Join us for another episode of Case Files next Friday.